Hello and welcome to Maritime Matters. My name is Captain Morgan DeWicke. I'm joined with me here today in Beaufort, North Carolina, President Eric DeWicke of the Northeast Maritime Institute and the mayor of Beaufort, North Carolina, Rhett Newton. And I'll have Rhett go ahead and introduce himself and his background. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Morgan and Eric. It's uh, great to have you back in Beaufort. Uh, you certainly bring a great energy here, and the Northeast Maritime Institute brings a great energy, and we've, we've really appreciate that, that partnership. It's made us all better. So, so thank you, and again, great to have you here in Beaufort. This is my hometown. This is where I grew up, uh, just a, about a block away from here. Uh, went to uh, East Carter High School, graduated, uh, off to college in the Air Force for about 30 years. Uh, I was an F-15E uh, Strike Eagle pilot and an Arabic uh, foreign area officer uh, during my military time. Retired back here to beautiful Beaufort. Um, I was uh, building drones on my kitchen table uh, out of the finest uh, Dollar Tree foam board and Martha Stewart <laughs> glue and tape and, and other things. And this is about the time that the Duke Marine Lab was building their drone lab. And I met uh, with the director, Dr. Dave Johnson. And he says, well, why don't you come volunteer? And I said, sure. He sent me all over the world, uh, Costa Rica, to, to, to look at the mass nesting of the Olive Ridley sea turtle over to Italy for archaeology, uh, off the coast of Florida for right whale research, or up in uh, Massachusetts uh, off of Nantucket with the gray seal population there. And he said, well, how would you like to, to uh, join the PhD program, apply for the PhD program? And I, I said, sure. Uh, so I'm using my GI Bill now. I'm in my fourth year of a five-year PhD program and, and just having the time of my life. Uh, unfortunately, my Air Force writing skills don't quite translate very well to the scientific <laughs> world, but I'm, I'm working way, my way through that as well. And uh, despite my better judgment, I was uh, elected to mayor of Beaufort in 2017. So I'm just in the, the my second term as the, as the mayor of Beaufort. And I will say that... Uh, if you choose to be an elected official, and I hope you do, uh, that you follow the path that I did, uh, which is unopposed. <laughs> that, that has worked out pretty nicely, but, but it's been great. I've had tremendous support in the town of Beaufort. Uh, we've made great progress even uh, with infrastructure concerns that we have with cleaning up our waterways. And we can talk about that after Hurricane Florence, all the, the different things that we did to clean up our waterways. So uh, Beaufort wants to be a leader, and we are a leader in so many different ways. Uh, but that being said, we still have some critical challenges. And I'd love to talk to you about those critical challenges here in town uh, as well. Definitely. So first off, why Beaufort? Why are we here in Beaufort? Uh, perhaps you want to tell the story of, of how we wound up here. Sure. Uh, you know, Beaufort to me um, really was a place we stumbled on. I, I knew of Beaufort based on Noah creating the Beaufort wind scale. And, um, you know, the Beaufort wind scale is something you have to learn about in order to be uh, a master mariner. And uh, I remember sitting for my third mate's license uh, on LNG tankers and, and um, the Beaufort wind scale would come up all the time. And uh, ironically, the Beaufort wind scale really is, is the reason probably we are here. Uh, Hurricane Sandy blew us in. And um, so literally, uh, I would say hours after Hurricane Sandy uh, blew past, um, we had to get out of Bellhaven uh, because basically the, uh, the bay was going to lose all of its water. When a hurricane leaves, it siphons out all the water. It's like, it, it, it's like a sink. It, it empties it out. Right. So uh, we got back on uh, underway. And we uh, had a fellow that had to go home for a wedding and had to get him ashore. So we came into Beaufort and a fellow by the name of uh, Weymouth Tillett came out with his uh, friend Jed uh, from the Beaufort City Docks. And they met us out in the channel because the channel had completely shifted. All the buoys had shifted because they're sand laden. And, um, you know, here we are on on. Uh, this great tall ship, this beautiful tall ship, and and we're exhausted. We we're beat up. Uh, you know, basically, um, we went inside. Bounty went outside. They sank. Uh, they had some uh, casualties. Uh, we went inside, settled in into uh, uh, Bell Haven, came to Beaufort, exhausted, and these people just welcomed us with open arms. And 
what a great community. And then we learn about the community history and we learn about its whaling history. And of course, you know uh, uh, how that, what that means to our family. And um, so I just started leaving the boat here in the winters, uh, Bertha here. And uh, uh, I fell in love with the people and fell in love with um, the fact that there's a need to promote seamanship and seafaring in the region for good paying jobs and us being part of Northeast Maritime and in our, our social project, right, of, of reaching out to people who might not have the same chances that the three of us would have had in life and, and give them opportunity for great paying jobs. And, and Beaufort needs that. And I think we've, we've started to participate in a pretty neat program here that, that uh, Mayor Newton asked us to develop. And he can talk about that later. But, you know, not only do we leave for the here, we, we're sitting here in, in a house that uh, we bought um, so we can participate more in the community of Beaufort. It is exciting. There's definitely a lot of unique parallels between here and home. Um, this is a fishing port, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, we come from one of the largest fishing ports in the U.S. And ironically, it's your creed of the Northeast Maritime Institute has been to honor the mariner. And at the local high school, the mascot is, in fact, the mariner. Um, so I think that's been something that's really fun for us. And there's been a lot of um, cross threads between the two communities. So perhaps you want to tell us about what role Maritime has played in developing the community here. Well, for, for, for the uh, viewers um, and the listeners, the uh, Beaufort is on this incredible, beautiful uh, coastal ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And this is, that's the starting point and the end point for our community really is, is, and that's why I'm so adamant about protecting this, uh, this uh, wonderful ecosystem that we have. But if you were in this uh, community on Front Street 301 years ago, you would look south of here and you would see Blackbeard the Pirate and his crew feverishly getting some of the supplies off of his uh, ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, onto three sloops. And you would say, well, that's just buffoonery of navigation. Uh, but the reality is the experts say that he was doing a little bit of corporate downsizing because he had just come back from blockading the port of Charleston, had gotten a little bit too big, and so he offloads to the sloops. He goes off uh, to, to Bath, North Carolina. The governor of North Carolina pardons him, and that's a whole different story. But Blackbeard, being the pirate that he is, couldn't stand it anymore, and he goes back to piracy, and he's killed off of Ocracoke a couple of weeks later. If you were in this position in 1812 on Front Street, you would see uh, blockade runners going in the in, through the shallows in the middle of the night getting supplies back and forth to Beaufort past the uh the the British blockade if you were here in 1862 you would see uh in the middle of the night free slaves from over in in Moorhead City helping Union soldiers go through the shallows actually underneath the cannons of Fort Macon that that protects Beaufort Inlet where there was a Confederate uh, fort at the time to the street corners of Beaufort and Beaufort wakes up and we're occupied. And, and you would say, well, m people must have been furious about that, and to a degree, uh, but we had such a close relationship with New England because we were so isolated. We were as close to New England as we were to New Bern. Right. So it wasn't as, uh, as much of an outrage as, as you would expect. And even some of the family names here have a very close association okay, with, with New thanks. England. Yeah, Chadwick is a very prominent name uh, that, that's here. And even the whaling community. Now, we had a whaling uh, community out on Shackelford Banks, which is now part of the Cape Lookout National Seashore. It was called the Diamond City. And these were very resilient people. They could take some hardship. And they just continually got pounded by hurricanes. And they said, we're sticking it out. They get pounded by another hurricane in 1896. They said, we're sticking it out. They got pounded by another hurricane in 1899. They said, we're out. Yeah. <laughs> So, so, but you can trace those names that often have lineage to, to, to New England 
to Moorhead City, to Beaufort. Uh, Moorhead City is actually called the Promised Land, uh, where they settled. And then down east, you can see see where all those families are. So that we're, we're, we are interconnected before uh, having the pleasure of meeting you uh, here, here in Beaufort as well. And even in World War II, if you were on Front Street, you would see the whole sky is lit up because German U-boats are off the coast of North Carolina and they're just having a ways in 1942 with the convoys that were going north and south. And we know that there are five U-boats that are actually off the coast right now. I had, had the fortune of diving on one, uh, not, not a U-boat, but the uh, um, one of the uh, victims of the U-boats, the Carib Sea. So it was just really neat to be able to dive on, on that ship and you're amongst these massive 12 foot uh, sand tiger sharks with the big gnarly teeth. Fortunately for me, they're very docile, yep. but it's a, it's a good story nonetheless, right? <laughs> Uh, but there are also U-boats that you can you can dive off off the coast of North Carolina. The, the Battle of the Atlantic is part of a NOAA initiative now uh, right now as well. So a lot of really close ties with with New England, and I just appreciate the partnership that, that we have developed. Yeah, definitely. So perhaps tell us about uh, this partnership that we have developed, and and what is this close connection uh, that we've been fomenting over the past couple of years and starting to develop? Sure. No, I I think. Um, you know, one of the things that I never know whether to call you Mayor Newton, uh, Rhett, or <laughs> Colonel uh, um, with my background. So, um, you know, the thing that Rhett really wanted to see was opportunity for not only the kids in Beaufort, but at East Carteret, which includes down east North Carolina. And, and Rhett's heart is focused on helping people out and, and allowing people to rise up regardless of who they are, where they come from, what their socioeconomic economic background is, or, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, the ideal uh, father of American values, right? right, and it, right. It's, it's raising people up, not keeping them down. And um, so he came to us, uh, your mother and I, and, and basically said, hey, you know, any opportunities for, for our kids. And so uh, we sat and talked and we decided to create a scholarship program for East Carteret High School. And uh, we have two uh, young men that have received, received scholarships, um, one right here in Beaufort and one from Atlantic. And um, young man from Beaufort uh, is actually interning this summer on Fritha. Uh, which is going to stay here um, uh, working with the Maritime Museum and the Friends of the Maritime Museum. Um, and uh, the other young man is is working on a tugboat out of New Bedford, uh, having the time of his life, uh, sending me videos every day. And this is a story um, that uh, I will tell you is probably the proudest story I have at NMI. Um, this young man came from a situation that wasn't healthy, uh, dysfunction within his upbringing, um, witnessed several overdoses in his family, um, and has taken himself up by the bootstraps with the occasional hug, with, the, with lots of love and lots of support. Um, and this kid's getting A's on exams. Uh, he is he is screaming through the curriculum, which is one of the toughest curriculums in the United States. It's what the Maritime Academies put into four years. We compress it into two from the nautical science side, which includes trig and physics and calculus. And we don't tell the kids that, by the way, because we don't want to scare them. Right. Um, and this young man is just doing dramatically well. And the young man from Beaufort is doing dramatically well. And then I think you just uh, uh, voted on uh, a third recipient of a full scholarship. Um, and and that's, that's just exciting, right? It's, it's creating this relationship that will be not only meaningful, but long-lasting between our communities. And, and gosh, you know, thank you for... For, uh, coming up with the concept and, and really promoting the concept to support people in your community with a need for education that might not have been able to afford it. It, it is exciting. Yeah, and it, it, this is really important because uh, our, our commercial fishing industry has collapsed. 
And so uh, those families that had depended on this for generations and generations really don't have that opportunity. So, uh, you know, uh, the younger generations are now having to leave. We've become a very senior community be because of that. And those that choose to stay, they find themselves in a tourism economy where there are a few good jobs in a tourism economy, but there's a lot of service jobs. And, and in many cases, those aren't, aren't living wage jobs either. So this was a great opportunity to offer this to uh, some of our high school students so that they could actually live in Carteret County and still have a, a really good wage and still be able to travel the world and come back to Carteret County as well. And, and I think the best advertisement for NMI is the students that are, are from here that come back here and say, yes, this is possible to live here, make a good good wage, and and but not have to, to uh, depart Carteret County. Yeah, yeah that's, that's kind of exciting for me about the whole concept of the maritime industry. You can live where you grew up, go away to work, come back, and that's that's how our industry works. You go to work for two weeks, you come home for two weeks. You go to work for six months, you come home for six months. And and it's it's the blessing of our industry. It's hard work, but again, it's it, it is also the sixth best paying career in the United States today, and that's dynamite. When you can graduate with a two-year degree and earn $76,000 a year right out, out of the blocks, that's fantastic. And be from anywhere. Right. You know, so to me, that is the exciting piece. It's the best bang for the buck in the United States educationally, I believe, um, because you you earn that back if you spent that money on your education. You earn that back within year one, right? And, and how many how many colleges or universities can make that claim? That's education, education for employment, right? right? And really building lives and opportunities in those zones. So again, I, I'm just tickled pink to see the opportunities for the kids in Down East and that East Carteret, and uh, hopefully we can expand this this concept further uh, within the region because I, I think it's well deserving of the region. Um, in in you know, the history is just so concentric with our fair haven in New Bedford history and the whaling industry and the fishing industry. It's not, it, it, they're two parallel communities, and it's, it's, it's really neat for me to see. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, I had the pleasure of going up to NMI uh, for the graduation earlier, and I was just blown away by Fairhaven and New Bedford. And you could just see that maritime heritage. You could feel it. It was just, it, it, it is the community uh, there as well. And it was good for me to see the students from East Carter. They were out of, they were clearly out of their comfort level. And, and that's a good thing, mm. you, you know, to, to get yourself out of that comfort level, to, to kind of explore other opportunities and then have the confidence that you can deal with being out of your comfort level as well. So that's another really critical aspect uh, for this because now they can bring a, a national perspective back to Carteret County and then eventually have that international perspective that they can bring back and that's healthy for everybody. Right. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about uh, the involvement of Duke Marine Laboratories here in the community as well. And uh, over in New England, we have uh, Hui, we have NOAA, just nearby. And so there's a lot of science that goes into um, sort of the maritime community. So how does that play a role here as well? Yeah. So Carter County has a marine science capacity. Uh, only um, the only comparisons would be uh, what you have in Massachusetts, what you have at Scripps, uh, what you have in Monterey Bay. Uuh, This tremendous. You have Duke, you have Carol New North Carolina, you have uh, North Carolina State, you have NOAA here, you have the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, you have three museums, you have an aquarium, you have Cape Lookout National Seashore, the Rachel Carson Reserve, the Community College, and the list goes on. We have tremendous marine science capacity, and it's, and it's looking at everything from the very microscopic genetic level all the way up to climate change and everything in between. And with, with the drones, and, and I... You know, when you think about drones, you're talking about aircraft, but we're, we're expanding well beyond aircraft. We have over 30 different type of aircraft uh, being multi-rotors or fixed wing aircraft, but we also have autonomous terrestrial vehicles where we did some sea, level, uh, sea turtle uh, research. We have uh, autonomous boats and we just got our first autonomous submersibles. And so eventually what you're going to see is you're going to see these uh, four different systems talking to each other. You're going to see swarms. 
you're going to see uh, videos from uh, Cape Lookout that a researcher in Japan will be able to, to review, and even better if the researcher from J Japan can control the payload. Uh, that's not, in, in, you know, not, not inconceivable. And then also onboard processing is advancing rapidly. So, so think about having artificial intelligence onboard that can do onboard processing, not only for deconflicting the aircraft from a wall or some other obstacle, but to actually be able to do photogrammetry of a, of a whale because we know a fat whale is a happy whale, right? Sure. So if you can do those measurements in near real time down in Antarctica, and then you can watch the whale when it gets off the coast of South America and that, that energy depletion to be able to get from you know thousands of miles. So it's a really exciting time right now, uh, both on the hardware and the software side. It's more mature now, so, so uh, there's the reliability is there, but it's also so, uh, so new that you don't have a mean time between failure for motors or speed controls or, or, or sensors. And, and, you know, as much as we love to watch the aircraft or the, or the autonomous boat, it's the sensor that's more important. What's more important than the sensor is the data. What's more important than the data is the data analysis because the farmer says, hey, I've got 50,000 acres here. I've got this much data, but I don't know what it means. So Morgan, your generation, if you can come up with some data analysis experts, they're going to make tens of thousands of dollars telling that farmer where he needs more fertilizer or less fertilizer, more water or less, less water. So that data analysis side is the real power. Yeah, I think going forward, it's going to be so critical that we have the capacity to gather marine data. And the issues that we're so, sort of starting to try and highlight ourselves and promote um, really is ocean warming and ocean acidification. I think those are two of the biggest things. Um, it doesn't just play an impact on the ocean. It plays an impact on all coastal ecology and, and really the globe, right? When the water starts to warm and the Gulf Stream becomes less effective, right? So how does that impact fisheries? How does that impact um, air streams, for example? How does it impact your local community, right? Where you have this rapidly changing ecology and, and you have to be able to collect that data. So is some of that data going into helping locals um, figuring out fisheries and things like that? Oh, a absolutely. And, and that's, that's a really broad subject too. Uh, using drones right now, we're watching barrier islands move at centimeter scale. The, the warming of the oceans is impacting the storms that we see. Now, fortunately at the Atlantic, those storms typically move fairly slowly. So we've got days that we can, can prepare for those type of things. Unlike the Gulf of Mexico, which is even warmer, it seems like they pop up and they can intensify very quickly like Hurricane uh, Michael did. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a very broad array of, of interests uh, using robotics and remote sensing uh, right now. And, and it's just improving every single day. But we can, we can look at this globally it, it does have a huge impact globally or regionally or statewide or, or nationally. And a, and a classic example is Dr. Rick Ludick over at UNC Institute of, uh, for Marine Sciences has developed a storm surge model mm -hmm. and it's very accurate. So when, the, when a hurricane starts rolling up the coast, I as an elected official can now tell people, if you're on an east facing community, you may face a six foot storm surge. So you need to, to, to get out of town. And, and, you know, we certainly saw uh, Ocracoke during Hurricane Dorian had a seven foot wall of storm surge coming from the, from uh, an internal waterway, not from the Atlantic Ocean there as well. There were 99 breaches of core banks uh, because of the storm a, a, as well. So the modeling has gotten much better. So I can, one of the th critical things that I need to do in a hurricane I've got all this information. How do I get it down to the family level so you can make personal decisions? Right. Because ultimately, you know, we can call for a mandatory evacuation, but it gets to the point the family has to make their decisions. And there's 50 different reasons that people don't evacuate. A lot of those are, are based on finances or pets or other type of things. But I want to make sure that they have had all the information they need to succeed. Right. Tell us about the impact of Hurricane Florence. You mentioned that earlier. How did that play out in this community and what was the response and, and the impact? Yeah, it, it was uh, it, it was devastating, and but I'll caveat that with it could have been a lot worse. So uh, seven days out, all the tracks said they were coming right right for Beaufort as a Category 4. And fortunately, as it, as it uh, kind of rolled towards the coast, it, it stagnated about uh, 60 miles off the coast and went, went westbound. 
Now that's bad news for Wilmington and Jacksonville, and those areas, but it, it just hovered over Eastern North Carolina for about three days, uh, just pounding us. And the, and the winds weren't extraordinarily strong, uh, but the rain, we had 30 inches of rain. Now for, for Beaufort, uh, we, our geography is such that the, the river waters will dissipate, but some of the inland communities um, are not so fortunate. So, so not only do they, they get hit with storm surge, but then they have to worry about the river flooding afterwards. Right. Uh, one, of, uh, one of my uh, mayor colleagues uh, west of New Bern had a 27 foot wall of water wow. and, and that was river flooding. Uh, New Bern and Newport, uh, the mayor of Newport, which is just a couple miles from, from here, uh, said his community was essentially three different islands, and they are they are pretty well in. Yeah, but let, let, let me just kind of interrupt for a second now. When when you explain a twenty seven foot wall of water, that is rise of tide at thirty feet to round up. Right, thirty feet. Uh, that is three stories. So three story buildings would have been underwater. Yeah. And, and people need to understand that this is a major, major issue, and and we are going to see more and more of it. And in fact, you know that science that that you guys are doing down here, and folks up at Woods Hole are doing, and Marine Biological Labs, and and NOAA, and Scripps, and you know, excuse me for if I left anybody out, but the bottom line is we now have to take that knowledge and put it to work. Right. And, and, and that's something that, you know, honestly, you know, we're, we're talking about a mechanism to do that. Um, it, it's going to be a, an aggressive and grandiose plan uh, to make it work. But, uh, um, you know, we're trying to decide whether to actually camp that program out here in, in your community um, because we, we, we have that, Simpatico between, you know, Buzzards Bay, which includes Woods Hole and Fairhaven and, and SMAST over at UMass Dartmouth. But we, we really need to do something. And, and we need to take that great, great science that's essentially sitting on the shelves and start to mitigate these problems. You know, if, if, we're, if we're getting 30, you know, 30 foot walls occur every other year, our communities are going to disappear more rapidly than folks realize. And, you know, we're talking about island communities disappearing completely. What happened in Ocracoke, you literally only had a few houses that weren't underwater. And, and, and I, I, I keep wanting to go back to, or go to Ocracoke to view the remnants, even though it's a year or, or two later. But the, the reality is what happened at Ocracoke was a telltale sign. We need to do something. And so, you know, I, I fear that people aren't listening enough and, and, you know, we really do need to tackle what we call up in Massachusetts, a wicked problem. And this is one wicked problem. It's, 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 it's it, it is global warming. You know, it is the, it's not so much the earth as much as the ocean warming, which is going to create catastrophe everywhere. Um, sorry to sound like it's a bit of a downer, but it's, it's our truth that we need to listen to and adhere to that truth. So we can actually, we cause the problem, I think, for the most part. Mm -hmm. I think we can reverse the problem. I, I believe in humanity. And I think I really do. It's kind of also a neat reason why we can be here is right. to start to solve problems. Right. Well, with, with climate change in general, you know, there's not much that a community of 4,200 in Beaufort or a community of 16,000 in Fairhaven can, can, I mean, we can do our part, but that part is not, not very big, but we do need to have candid conversations. Um, some of these, these uh, communities are not sustainable. We need to be able to have that candid conversation as well with the modeling that's that's available to, to let people know that. And and I think uh, one of the key indicators that you see now is along the eastern seaboard, some property values are decreasing and some insurance rates are increasing. And I think that's just kind of leading indicators of, of sea level rise and climate change as well. So these are this is part of the data. That, that we need to, to review very closely. And it is complex, no doubt about it. 
but we can have those candid conversations. Yeah. Well, numbers don't lie. That's 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 what we need to really understand is that numbers don't lie. And, and I think you know what what our small community of 4,200 in Beaufort and 1,600 in Fairhaven, Massachusetts, can do is tell the story. And storytelling is what is going to change how people think and, and where they're going to focus and put their energies in, in both a social concept as well as a political concept. We, we need to have to put our arms around this and, and tackle it as a global we, by the way. Right. This isn't just a U.S. problem. It's, it's not an island nation problem. It's a global problem. It's impacting the whole world. So it's it's while it's scary, it's exciting that we can come together and maybe these little communities can actually be the uh, solutions providers. So. Yeah, I think the evidence is there, and it's it's undeniable, right? It's and that's what's so critical critical about your work and the work of your colleagues is is you're identifying the problem and and it's about translating that data into you know an effective communications, right? It's it's telling people the story and. Uh, I think what it comes down to is is teaching people to be proactive versus reactive, right? It's it's we want to look out for our future. Let's not wait till it comes. Let's plan now, and so we're better off in ten years instead of being screwed in five and then having five years of trying to figure out, hey, what do I do? Um, so it's really a humanitarian approach, and um, I think you have to explain it in economic terms and. I think that's what people are so worried about. As you mentioned, it's some people don't leave when a hurricane comes because perhaps it is a financial issue. And um, I think we have to overcome those financial challenges and those financial worries and find solutions for people because at the end of the day, sometimes the dollar speaks for people, um, unfortunately, right? So um, is there anything you guys are doing in Beaufort you're looking 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, 20 years down the road, maybe just five years down the road that you're planning for these outcomes. Well, uh, let me just back pedal just a second to say uh, there is a, a huge socioeconomic divide in Carteret County. And this isn't unique to Carteret County, uh, but uh, Hurricane Florence, we knew it was there. Hurricane Florence exposed it. Hurricane Dorian widened it. And this current pandemic has widened it even, even more. So those that have resources are able to recover at a rate much faster than those that don't have resources. And we have so many underserved communities here in Eastern North Carolina, and they really struggle. I mean, uh, with Dorian roll through, we still had lots of families that, that have had blue, blue tarps on their roofs and, and, and they have no place to go. So a lot of people won't report their, their water damage or the mold or the mildew because they really have nowhere else to, to go. So that socioeconomic divide is has to be part of our calculus always because it's there. Kind of like the drug abuse and addiction. You can you can turn a blind eye to it if you want to, but it's still going to affect you. So these are, these are really critical components of this. We have some historic uh, flooding areas that we have to deal with. We just have to. We can't, we can't kick the can in any further. Um, one of them is in a northeast part of the, the community, but even Front Street, uh, we had flooding on the 400 and 500 block. And for the listeners, this this is kind of our commercial district here. Uh, the 400 block uh, hasn't been historically uh, flooding. The 500 block has, but this is unsustainable. If we don't do something about it, these business owners are going to say, we're out of here. We can't continue to rebuild every time a, a storm rolls through. So we, we know we've got to redo our boardwalk. We know that we've got the bulkhead underneath there that's starting to, to crumble. So when we rebuild, why don't we consider sea level rise as part of that component? So that's part of that planning of thinking, yes, it's coming. We know it's coming. How do we anticipate uh, the, the sea level rise and do something about it? And how do you address, as you just mentioned, that disproportionality of income, right? So uh you know the, that the, the wealthy are going to be well off and they're going to be able to create solutions for themselves. And what about the little guy? What about the guy that doesn't have that income and can't afford that? So I think as a, as a community, as a nation, as a whole, we've got to come up with solutions for everyone, right? right? We can't just assume that they're going to rebuild because they might not be able to afford it. Right. And I think we've really got to start looking out for each other because one of the, the downfalls of the situation we're in economically nationwide is we're not looking out for low-income people. Um, 
capitalism is great to an extent, um, but I think it's gone way above and beyond um, balance, right? So how do we get some of that balance back and how do we sort of return uh, opportunity back into the hands of low income and middle class people? So maybe another topic for another day. It's a, it's a big one, yeah, sure. That's, that's but, why we're kind of here. Right? Right. It, it, is, it is creating opportunities, employment opportunities for well-paying jobs, and we'll figure that out. And, and you know, quite honestly, you know, after this, uh, after we hit the stop button on this conversation, uh, we, we met with a, a boat builder, a small boat builder with 30 employees that, you know, they, they will have 180 employees within two and a half years, a New England boat builder that moved down south and, and um, it's opportunity for people. Right, right. But, but not only is it opportunity uh, just for kind of, you know, lower labor producing jobs, uh, there are opportunities for education models and teaching people how to become engineers and, and systems engineers and, and really start to build up the economy through um, the opportunity of well-paying jobs. That, right, that, right. That's critical, right? And, and um, it's not easy diversifying an economy that has 200 years of history that it's not been diverse. Right. And we dealt with that, by the way, in Fairhaven and New Bedford in the 80s and 90s. The, right. the fishing fleet collapsed. Uh, the ground fishing collapsed and from overfishing. And, you know, the government came in and they started to regulate the scallop industry. The scallop industry through regulation is one of the most thriving fisheries in the United States, if not the most thriving because New Bedford actually is the number one port in the nation based on income. Well, and that's because of the scallop industry. So, and not, it's not, it's not a close second. There's a major Delta between one and two. And, and so, uh, you know, people think about regulation as being a, an adverse thing. It's not right. Especially if it's data driven, driven. Um, you know, regulations can really save us a, as a populace. And if it's the Wild West, we end up overfishing, we end up, you know, depleting, and nobody's, nobody knows what to do to change it, right? And so you have to manage systems. And I think this region, I, I always say when I travel around the world, you know, do a, do a quick analysis of, you know, cultural analysis uh, of, skill set analysis and then you come up with a plan for economic development yep. right so you look at history and tradition um, in order to facilitate economic growth you have history you have tradition okay how are you going to run with that you know while it's not too diverse you can you can diversify opportunities within that knowledge bed if you will and um, you know again it, Northeast Maritime, I'm going to keep plugging it. You know, Northeast Maritime is developing five new degree programs to implement over the next five years. One of them is sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. You know, people don't realize that an ounce of seaweed or kelp sells more than an ounce of marijuana. And it, it is a great business to do. It. it is a great opportunity for people to actually have great sustainable foods. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've switched over to a plant-based diet uh, pretty much and, and kelp is an important part of what we should be doing in terms of the nutrients that we need and, and, and all of that. Fish farming can be done really, really, really well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you have quite a bit of that locally. Um, oysters, you know, one oyster. Uh, cleans three gallons of water um, per hour. That's that that I, I'm, that's phenomenal, right? So in, in oysters that can feed you can also clean your waterways and estuaries. And, and North Carolina is famous, and the Carolinas and the and uh, you know the Chesapeake are famous for their oysters. These are opportunities that you can start to augment your economy. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's it's a wonderful thing that you folks are so open to that, and, and you are taking a leadership role in facilitating new economies and these ideas. It's 
I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I have more hope for you than uh, probably you do, because I, I, <laughs> I, I think I think I'm watching things happen in, in, in a systemic way, in an intellectual way, in a in a in a disciplined way, which, you know, thank you to the uh, Air Force for straightening you out. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I see this this discipline that is being enacted in ways that your community is thriving right now. Anybody who thinks not, it needs to stick their head back in the sand. Your community is thriving because of the way you are planning, the people that work with you are planning. It is, it is neat to watch, and, and your community deserves you. And, and really, I, I think it's neat to be a kind of an outsider and observing. It's, it's really fun. So. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I am very fortunate. Uh, I am fortunate to... Uh, to, to have had all the opportunities and to continue to meet great people and NMIS has certainly been a blessing uh, as well. So I really appreciate it. Well, we certainly recognize this town as a truly special place. Um, we encourage anybody who hasn't been here to come. Um, we're just blown away every time we come down here. And no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's peaceful. It's quiet. There's, there's so much going on. The food's amazing. The people are as kind as it gets. So, uh, there's our full endorsement of Beaufort and uh, you are the mayor. So we know you have your duties and we'll let you get back to them. But thank you for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Thank you.